You are listening to The Minority Experience with Sochi Ledesma and Dr. Terrence Underwood. Hey, Terrence. So how have you been? You know what? I can't complain, but it's not going to matter. So everything is all good. (laughs) Well, good to hear. I did want to touch point on a few things and specifically next week. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how you're feeling and how things are going within your household as we prepare to enter election week. Uh, You know, you know, what's uh, crazy. Um, Me and my wife went and voted actually last week. So we, we did the early voting. And, you know, one, I thought it was going to be like a lot of people in line, but ironically, we were able to, you know, just kind of go in and come right back out. Um, And, but, you know, it's it's funny, I was, as I was, you know, making my ballots, you know, I realized, I'm just being vulnerable here, that I didn't know all the people on there, you know, and, 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 you know, I felt, and I was like, you know what, for the next time, I really need to make sure I do my due diligence, because I really was only focused on just the, you know, the main election, you know, as far as the presidency. And so, yeah. uh, you know, I, in the future, I really need to make sure that I know who's on the ballot, have a little bit of information about them, as opposed to, you know, making a selection where I didn't feel 100% comfortable because I didn't have all the information I needed to make, uh, you know, really a, a, a good choice. Yeah, um, I've seen a lot of websites showing up where they get to summarize a lot of the main points of the platforms of the local elections. And I think that is very helpful, but I actually only found it because I asked a friend, but it's one of those things where these types of resources are not readily available. I feel like on the election website, you should just have that quick summary. Right, right. No, 100% agree. Um, Now on the flip side, you you know, I'm I'm a little bit nervous in in a sense. So, you know, and again, just being a little bit vulnerable here, I, I feel like if Trump loses you know i feel like it's it's going to be just mayhem in the streets and you know yeah. I, and, and i told my you know I, have, I got like kind of big kids now but i was telling them that you know the day after the election after the election either way whoever wins do not go outside like we need really? to let it settle down just to make sure that there's no the riots going on and things like that, because again, you just you just don't know what's going to happen. So I'm I'm a, actually I'm a little bit nervous to to see what happens after yeah. the election. What I mean, I you? I agree. Uh, there's high anxiety and in different forms, but thank you for sharing. I, I'm actually back um, visiting my parents um, for a couple of weeks, and my dad is actually leaving to Mexico next week. And it was half joking that my mom and I are like, well, watch out. If Trump wins, you may not be able to come back into the U.S. if he pulls the same moves that he did last year, where he would just close off the border. And my dad's a citizen. But it's just so sad to me that even citizens at this point have anxiety about basic rights that they should have. Yeah. Um, well, one, you know, we made a comment about your, your dad. That That's one of those comments where it's like, hmm, how should I respond to that? that, that yeah. <laughs> I can laugh. <laughs> gotta let, I gotta leave that one alone. I gotta leave that one alone. But I, I can, I definitely understand. Um, right, we were I, laughing. I we're imagine, like... I can only imagine the, exa- the anxiety, just seriously, you know, as, as it relates to, you know, that as far as your dad, you know, going back to Mexico and things like that. Um, I, you know, and then, so just think about this, this anxiety that people are feeling, even you, for example, now we still have to go to work, right? So we're carrying yeah. this, this extra weight on in, in, you know, in the workplace, you know, how do you think people are handling that? Oof. Um, that's a big question. I think as much as we try to separate the two worlds, our personal and also our work lives, It doesn't matter. We're coming in as people to both. We have the same beliefs and we also have the same pains that we're carrying. I think that's something that we all just need to realize and ideally also help each other with. So for example, I think the pandemic has really exacerbated biases. And what I mean by that is that we've been locked up with um, other people that are similar to us, our partners, our families with the same assumptions, backgrounds, and I think it's created a little bit of that group think along with social media, which I mm-hmm. won't get into that one. That's a whole nother talk to get mm-hmm. into. But that plus the height racial tensions with the elections coming up, I really feel like right now work environments are experiencing heightened biases. 
Yeah. And it's actually affecting both sides, dominant and non-dominant groups in the workplace. Yeah, no, 100% agree. And, you know, you made this, the comment about social media. How many people are deleting? Like every time I log on to social media, it's like everyone is talking about deleting people uh, every every single yeah. day. And it's like, wow, you know, people are really just, you know, coming out of the woodworks and showing a side of themselves that I, I guess people wouldn't typically see. Exactly. Um, but, but the reality is people can't be authentically themselves you know, just in general, but more importantly, even at work. I mean, so take me, for example, I, mean, I used to be in work at an organization that was like very corporate, right? I, mm-hmm. I, there was no way I'd be able to wear this beard this long and earrings in my ear and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a thing that, you know, people just can't, can't be themselves, you know? And when you think about from a social media perspective, again, some people's viewpoints are, you know, different from yours and we have to respect everybody's views and, and I think that's where we have some of the biggest challenges and again shows up yeah. in the workplace if I'm if I'm different from you um you should have respect for me either way uh, even if we are not aligned in, in, in a lot of different things um but when I think about that how do you think people are surviving this like how you know how how do you think people are being able to handle this on a day-to-day basis not being able to be themselves yeah I mean it's hard to to really get a gauge on overall. I know that within my circle of friends and also colleagues, there's a lot of talk about just taking space to recuperate, to give your, yourself some time to just um, not sit, I guess, with all these biases or um, negative information, whether it's social media. So to your point, I've actually heard a lot of people not only deleting others, but actually deleting their accounts or going on a pause mm. from social media mm-hmm. because it just gets to the point that it's not of enjoyable practice to do. So I know right. that's one thing, but within the workplace, personally, I've gone through a very similar kind of trend in the last few months where I do get a sense that there are more biases coming up. I think people, because it's high stress given the pandemic mm-hmm. and also the, the work mm-hmm. environment, people are shorter in maybe being aware of how their comments and their language is coming across. And we know this through microaggressions. So microaggressions, it doesn't matter if it's intended or not intended, really what matters is the impact. So I think we need to really come back to understanding how is it that our language is affecting others and also our tone. And I know people are like, ah, you know, tones vary, but I think a lot of times you can understand how a person may mean something based off of that tone. Right, Um, right, right. Yeah, so I think- bad pun, um, but tones matter. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, So I think those are the key things that you can do from an introspective perspective. Now from an external, I have my support group. And what I mean by my Mm -hmm. support group is those two or three people at work that are just like my go-to like emotional support individuals where I just go and I'm like, I'm having such a bad day. Can you believe this? And they just share the thirst. And what I mean by that is that they come back and they tell me, oh, I felt that too last week. And not that I want to normalize what I'm feeling, but at the same time, it does help a lot of times to hear, you know what? I'm not the only one that's experiencing these heightened biases. Out there. Right, right, right. No, you make a good point. You know, you know one of the things I, I noticed is that, you know, a lot of people cover or, or code switch, you know, because people work in uninclusive environments keep a less threatening on-demand alternative of themselves to be more accepted, right? It's like, I want to keep my work life as stress-free as possible. So therefore I may assimilate just so that I can make it through the day. Uh, And ironically, so I also, you know, of course I I do anger therapy uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten so many requests lately from DNI practitioners that are, are just, they're up, they're mad because it's, it's like some people are, you know, just thrown into these roles simply because they're the only black person in that works in the organization. Yeah. You have some people who take the role because they feel like it's a great opportunity in the career. Um, but you know, the reality is they get into the role and realize, wow, I can't, I can't move people. I can't change people. This is high stressful. I can't get anything done. No one's listening to me. And, and it's like the, the emotion is like piling up and you know, I just, I, you know, I feel like there's going to be just a high level of people with, that's going to be turning over in a lot of these roles simply because the, the organization wants it, 
but I don't know if they're actually ready to receive it and start implementing and, and, and to create these inclusive yeah. environments. They don't value, I think, the, the program itself. I agree. But I'm very interested to hear what kind of recommendations do you have for people with that anger, whether they're DNI professionals or even just experiencing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so one, you have to understand your trigger. That's the very first thing. It's the, the goal is to mitigate so that you don't have to really deal with the, the triggers. You know, it's hard. Once the trigger hits, it's hard to really um, control that emotion. So the best thing is to not even be a part of it. So just understand what your triggers are so that you know how to sidestep it when, when you see it coming. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in the workplace, you know, when, when, you know, people are really upset and not being able to make these changes, that's known because they don't understand the change management process. And so mm. I always recommend people to, you know, look at pro sci or, or any change management process so that you get yeah. an understanding of like, what to expect, you know, a lot of times people aren't able to measure the change that they're trying to implement. And even when they try to measure it, they don't understand that, yeah, you may have the awareness, but do people really have a desire to change? And, and so you really have to have a, a good understanding of, of change and how to manage through change, because ultimately the leader is going through change, the direct report is going through change, the yeah. organization is going through change. Anytime you think about like just implementing something as as big as inclusion, diversity, and equity into the workplace. Yeah, and you actually bring up a good point. When it comes to change management, there's, you know, typically it's spoken through processes, like updating processes, changing teams, org structures, but this is touching upon behavior, which given your background, you know more than anything. Changing behavior is a very tough thing. It's almost, you know, going back to if that person does not want to change, they're not going to mm -hmm. change. Right. Right. Yeah. I, you know, behavior is a, you know, behavior is a, is a, is a crazy thing because people are so stuck in their ways. I, I guess the best way to say it, that they don't see change as intuitive or they don't see change as future oriented, or they don't see change as a way to really make, you know, their work life better for themselves. And, and so when they can't see what's in it for them, they don't really see the change. It's hard for them to take the bias that they've been living with for years yeah. and then say, you know what, I may have been looking at this wrong because people don't, I don't think they have enough humility. They don't want to be vulnerable enough to say that, you know, I, I just don't know. And yeah. so therefore people continue on the same destructive path that they've been on, not necessarily for them, but for everyone else that they're like driving these microaggressions to, or driving these biases to, or, you know, these things are just continuing to promote these uninclusive environments that makes life horrible for anyone in a marginalized group. Yeah, no, that speaks a lot to me um, from a personal standpoint and also from a work perspective. So I will share that I started going to therapy back in 2016. And I remember I went there because I was having testing anxiety. And I was like, all right, I wanna come in, fix me so I can just take this test and I'll be fine. And all of a sudden we start unraveling that the reason why I had this anxiety is that I was approaching schooling. I was approaching life and success and achievement in a very biased way where there was one way to do it and I didn't see any other way to the point that it was hurting myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the key things that really led me to understand a lot of times we have a set way of doing it, but we may be hurting ourselves by mm -hmm. not being open to other ideas. And mm -hmm. I will share that that experience has made me be more open to changing my own behaviors. Cause I also went through the practice of doing it and it is not easy, as you said, cause you have to be vulnerable with yourself. Right. You may right. have the wrong idea for, you know, 15 years of your life. And you just have to let right. it go. Right, right. You know, that, that's that's interesting. You, you know, I one of the things I'm, I'm constantly telling people is th therapy actually is pretty is pretty good. I mean, I, I, I take therapy myself, you know, I'm a therapist because especially when you think about it in the workplace, right? If something happens or if someone says something to you, you know, you don't necessarily want to gossip. Uh, and I don't want to call it gossip because if, if you're expressing something, then necessarily have to be yeah. gossip. But if you if you're expressing something to a peer or a colleague and then they take that same information, tell another colleague, because it's just, it's on their mind, right? They don't, may not know yeah. what to do, may not have, know how to handle that information. So they ask someone else and then it just keeps building and building and building. Now, whole organization is 
uh, has, you know, knows whatever that challenge was you had. And it may not be the same way that you presented it because people interpret things differently. So Telephone. It, you know, you, exactly. <laughs> So when you can tell somebody that's a third party and really express like how you feel and then get guidance from them, you know, it, it just, to me, I think it helps to create the, an environment where you, know, you get to understanding and it's not about gossip. It's not about misinterpreting something that you said. It's really about understanding how to go straight to the source, handle it, yes. be done and then move forward. And now you don't have any lingering things, uh, comments that someone might've shared that you wanted to be just between you and that person. I agree. Um, I think, so you brought up um, that you do therapy in order to help this. I have two forms of therapy. I have my actual therapy and then I have my physical therapy. So I practice Muay Thai and typically I like to give myself for big problems um, or challenges that I have typically like one day to just go work it out, kind of get my emotions um, settled and then look at it from an objective perspective as much as I can. Um, And then move forward into your point, one of the key things that I've done is going straight to the source because Mm -hmm. there's no point in getting or spreading any ideas. Again, those could be biases. Even if you don't want that to come off as a bias, you are telling a certain perspective. I think it's Mm -hmm. important sometimes to address it first and then see where that goes from a solution perspective. Yeah, no, well, first, well, let's go back for a second because you, you, you said Muay Thai. And, and so <laughs> uh, I, uh, my bias kicked in automatic, like, how in the world is she doing Muay Thai? Now, that, that's, that, again, I, I own that because that crossed my mind. And I was like, I just can't imagine Sochi doing no Muay Thai. But, um, but anyway, <laughs> well, no, I, see, you it, haven't, you haven't um, been on the other side because sometimes, you know, I do Muay Thai, I record it, and then I send it to the person that's maybe having some issues with me. I'm like, hmm, here you go. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna have to stay on the good side. I don't want to be a part of, I don't want to receive that video. And then now all of a sudden I'm going, <laughs> but um, no, no, that's awesome. You, you actually make a good point because uh, health and wellness actually plays a part in your, your stress level. I mean, so even me lately, um, actually, I, mean, I just bought a bike and, you know, it's funny. I, I've had, I don't know, I'll, I'll tons of bikes throughout my, my life, but um, I never had the right bike. Like I, I literally went to a bike specialist, got fitted for the right bike. And now like oh, wow. every morning, like I'm doing six miles. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, I'm, I'm yeah. way out of shape, you know? So, uh, but I like doing it. The point is I actually, I like the bike. I'm, I mean, like this bike is like a part of me. Like every time I get on, I feel like, you know, this old movie Quicksilver, you probably remember that. It's bike. that outlet. Yeah. And getting back yeah. to kind of, dealing with it or with these emotions, um, dealing with even biases at work, like we've been discussing, I think it's important to have those outlets. And I shared my outlet of having those two, three people that I go to, but also Mm -hmm. having a personal outlet. I know a lot of my friends have started meditating, painting. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. for me, it's been that physical side of things. But I think that's another way too to kind of cope with a lot of the emotions that we have, finding a way to just let it go. Because I think the holding on of a lot of this is what really hurts us and others as well, because Mm -hmm. it's almost like a a ticking time bomb. Uh, When we talk about microaggressions, it's, for example, the fact that my name gets mispronounced. Sure, the first few people that mispronounce it, I let it go, it's fine. But for some reason, once we get around the 10th time in that week, it's just, you know, I'm gonna be like, my name is this, (laughs) and this is how you say it, thank you. And it may come off strong, but people need to understand that it's, a, it's like the bug bites that just keep on adding yeah. up. And at one point, you're just in so much pain that you just have to burst out right. and let it go. Well, I mean, it, one is respect, right? And it's important to you. I mean, everybody, I mean, you should better get your name said correctly. And, and I own it because I know it took me a good 17 times to get your name right. So I, I apologize again, because I really was struggling on trying to get, trying to say it right. But again, to your point, uh, this is something that you we, you have to put an effort in, you you know, it's out of respect. I mean, that's you you have to say a person's name correctly, which, you know, when I think about microaggression, that's what it is, a microaggression, you know, so it's not about the intent. It's not about like, you know, I didn't mean to, that, that doesn't matter. It's all about the impact of the person receiving it. So in this case, you, I mean, you're, again, the more you hear people say your name incorrectly, I mean, it, it just, it's, it's a buildup and it's, it, one, and it's just disrespect. And speaking about the buildup of biases, I think a lot of times we talk about biases as the person who delivers them. Um, for example, 
we talk about politicians and the things that they're saying and how terrible it is that we as a country have these leaders saying these things. But a lot of times we don't talk about, well, what about the population? How's that shaping us? Mm -hmm. And something that I was thinking is, regardless of what happens next week, I think that when we do come back in person to our work environments, that's going to be a huge mm -hmm. moment for mm -hmm. DNI and change management too. But let's talk about DNI. So now we have these individuals, like I said, that have been surrounded by like-minded people. And now they're going to come back and interact with others that they may have not interacted with. So for example, I, if I don't work with anyone that is black with directly within my team, so virtually I don't meet with anyone, and all of a sudden I come to the workplace and I walk by someone that's black, how is that going to mm. react? Mm. I don't know. Have you given this any thought or have you heard about this in any of no. the therapy sessions? Uh, no, actually you, you just... Wow. I mean, you, you just gave me a vivid picture, you know, because, you know, just thinking about already just the high level of domestic violence that's happening, yeah. um, just the, I mean, the level of stress. I mean, all these things that's happened to people individually, right? Take away mm -hmm. any DNI, just, just as on a personal level. Now, if I already have a bias to your point, if someone has a bias towards a person of color, LGBTQIA plus community, yeah. any, if you have a bias towards someone in a marginalized group and you are not interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis or ever, I mean, right, if they're not a part yeah. of your team, you're not, you know, getting them virtually, you go back into the workplace, you know, it's been almost a year. Now you're back, you know, you're in the workplace. Oh, those biases have to be, will be extremely potent, right? And you, again, yeah. you add on the fact that you've been dealing with all these other possibly domestic issues or high stress levels. If you have, you know, roommates and you just don't have privacy, like all that is at the core. And then when you come back and add in those biases that you, you wasn't thinking about because you wasn't around those people yeah. in a marginalized group it's going to be mayhem. I mean, that's just in my opinion. I, I think it's people are really going to be struggling when they get back to the workplace and have to start integrating it again with exactly. people who they, again, they have biases towards. I agree. And I think it's going to be hard for both the dominant and non-dominant group. I mean, you kind of see that already a little bit with the fear of saying something because it might be perceived the wrong way from both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also going to speak to the biases where either people are gonna be so separated because they're gonna be afraid of each other to a certain degree of saying the wrong thing, interacting in the wrong way, or there's gonna be a lot of clashes as the reintegration happens. So going back to change management, if you're looking at companies, it's like, how does that merger and acquisition work if you've mm. separated a, a company and then you put them back into another? Yeah, no, I, I can, again, I can. all I see is mayhem, but you know what? I need to be more optimistic. So I'm going to say, you know what? Everything is going to work out fine. It's going to be great. We'll go back. No <laughs> yeah, everybody's going to self-correct, you know, so let me keep the positivity up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's always a pleasure having these conversations uh, with you. And, um, you know, I look forward to the next one. And I'm all, I always learn something. I always feel good after our conversations. And um, uh, again, I, I look forward to, the, to, the, to our next meeting. Same here. And thank you so much for chatting. Talk to you soon. Yes.